speaking up and active, people active in their communities, that I'm not talking about a fringe minority or a silent majority, but the silenced majority, silenced by the mainstream media. The media today represents a minority elite. These all have to be challenged, and many people are doing it. It's Michael Franti here. This is Amy Goodman with Rochester. Rochester Indian Media. Hi, I'm Dawn, the Barefoot host with Rochester Indie Media's Indie TV, and today we have Myra Brown from ARM, the anti-racism movement. Thank you for coming, Myra. And Myra is also a lay minister at Spiritus Christi. But we're mostly going to be talking about racism, both here um, in Rochester, some local things that we've been experiencing, and just nationally, and um, what is racism and institutionalized racism, and Myra is going to help us get a grasp of this and figure out what we can do to um, work on our communities, on ourselves, on uh, the structures that exist in our society. So thanks, Myra, and tell us about ARM, uh, anti-racism movement, what exactly you're doing with that. Yeah, ARM is a coalition of community members and church members from the greater Rochester community who've come together to form this movement uh, to create a more just and equitable society. But we realized that we had to kind of bring that vision down to where we live and start right here in Rochester. Mm -hmm. And so we've been formed for two years. This is our second year. Um, and so our belief is that it only takes 20 years to change a seemingly permanent culture. Hmm. And that if we work intentionally and we work collectively, that we can dismantle systemic and institutionalized racism. And so we are advocating for a 20 year plan hmm. for every organization, institution, family institution, whatever it is to take up racial justice work and begin hmm. to do the work of dismantling those structures that have kind of held us in this dance of oppression, the systemic um, wounding of one another, and mm -hmm. where we don't know how to get out. Mm -hmm. We don't, we want it to stop, but we're not quite sure where do we start. Mm -hmm. And how have you proceeded then the past couple years? Where have you been starting? ARM started with a community conversation. Um, we started with conversation actually within the church at Spiritus Christi Church with members, and it's a church who's predominantly white in its constituency, and realizing that we needed to have the conversation about the ways in which we live out our different realities. And we found that in the sharing of our stories that we had some really deep insights that people just never thought about. Mm -hmm. uh, people of color didn't think about, and white people didn't think about. And so we started that way, by having a film festivals, discussions, really talking about how race impacts us up close and personal, mm -hmm. how it impacts us economically, how it impacts us socially, how it impacts us, you know, on every front in every part of our lives. Mm -hmm. But if we don't think about it, it'd be really easy to miss it. And do you feel that the group, the demographic of the group is very diverse with a uh, multitude of groups uh, with different backgrounds, racial diversity from not only the black and white dichotomy that often gets played, but um, African Americans, white, um, the Mexican community, a big immigration community here in this area, as well as the Muslim community. Are you finding that intersection of all the groups getting involved? We have um, actually had intersections with all of those groups that, that you've named. Um, as ARM has called community conversations together, if we've called leaders together to sit in the circle to talk about what's happening from their leadership position and what power dynamics need to be looked at mm -hmm. and addressed, um, what accountability and mutuality needs to be in infused um, in those circles, as we've mm -hmm. called the community together, have mm -hmm. been representation from all of those mm -hmm. groups. Um, and so it's really important because anti-racism work really is anti-oppression work. Mm -hmm. So it really calls for the beloved community mm -hmm. to be a part of that work. And are you then um, seeing that 
white members within the community are understanding how racism, because you think racism, well, I'm not a person of color, so then it doesn't affect me, and then I don't need to do the work. Are people getting it more and more? And for those who aren't, how can we go about making it understood that it's all of our work? I think what we found is that white people have to um, be willing to put themselves in a culture and an environment to keep hearing that message. Um, and if they do that, then they'll get it. Um, mm -hmm. If they don't do that, then it becomes harder and harder for white people to get that. At Spiritus Christi, for example, I've been preaching about racism probably for t 10 years or more. Um, as well as the staff at, at Spiritus Christi. When we decided to become an anti-racist church and take up that agenda, we realized it was really important that not only that the people of color who preach talk about how racism impacts us and share those stories, but all the white preachers need to do that. And so as we began to collectively work to put that message out, it, we realized that it began to really make a difference in more and more of our white constituency around how much people were really getting it. Mm -hmm. And we realized how much help they needed mm -hmm. to unpack it mm -hmm. in that way. Mm -hmm. For ex Go ahead. There was a, one example is there was a, a white male older gentleman who was part of um, the protest that happened around the public defender selection process. Mm -hmm. And he came up to me um, after we had protest at um, the county office building and he said, I have to tell you that I sat in the pews and I listened to you preach about the impact of institutionalized racism on people of color and I didn't get it. I didn't get it until you sent me an email and asked me to come to the protest. He said, and I came to the protest, and as I stood there and I was taking in the culture of oppression and the culture of the way that people of color were being targeted, and that we as white people, our whiteness didn't count anymore, mm -hmm. that we were white, just by the fact that we were there with you, mm -hmm. that we were treated so disrespectfully. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't the way that he was accustomed to being treated as a white person going to ask mm -hmm. for his political um, involvement and mm -hmm. accountability, and he said mm -hmm. the scales in that moment began to fall off my eyes and mm -hmm. I finally got it. Mm -hmm. So being willing to put ourselves, to listen, to expose ourselves to realities that maybe are not our realities as white members of society. So quick, a working definition of racism before we go to break, can we do that? Yeah, Ra a working definition of racism is race prejudice plus the use of power in systems and institutions. So it's when the systems and institutions that we've been con that we've constructed historically reflect our race prejudices mm -hmm. and gives that to people of color as they try to access what they need within those systems. Great, thank you. We're talking with Myra Brown today from the anti-racism movement and you're watching Rochester Indie TV and you can check us out online, rochesterindymedia.org and you're gonna find a lot of information about ARM and the whole boycott around Wham and the Bob Lonsbury Show. Check it out and stay tuned, Rochester Indie Media. Oh, hi. I'm Steve Heiss. I'm the producer and editor of the Indie Media Newsreel, which is the program you're watching right now. Or, well, I mean... Very, very important message, so listen very carefully. Not now, now, because now, now, I'm recording this, and then I have to edit it, and, but, but I mean, for your now, right now, as you're watching this, it's now. Um, well, anyway, um... Newsreel is a monthly program that's been in production for about seven years. Every month, activist video producers from around the country, around the world even, send in video segments about events in their communities. Events where people are standing up for what they believe in and trying to make a difference in the world. However, we have a problem. Lately, for whatever reason, when I sit down toward the end of the month to work on putting together the next month's program, I look at the pile of submissions sent to me and, well, that pile's been pretty empty. For some reason, people just aren't sending very much in. And I'm not sure why, but I need contributions to make the show happen. I can't just make it out of thin air. I need other people's documentaries. Little documentaries. Two minutes, five minutes, ten minutes about things going on around them in their communities. So if you're watching this and you like this program, maybe you can help. Maybe you make videos or know someone who does. 
someone who's involved with a local struggle and wants to document that struggle. Or maybe someone who's already making short little documentaries and wants more opportunities to get the word out about what they're doing. There's more details about this project at newsreel.indymedia.org. Help spread the word. Thanks for your help and thanks for watching. Hi, Dawn, the Barefoot host with Rochester Indie TV, and today we're talking to Myra Brown from Anti-Racism Movement here in Rochester and a lay minister at Spiritus Christi. And uh, we were just talking about racism and white privilege, and we just started really getting into the work that we need to do. It's not racism is not something that's a people of color's problem. It's really um, I guess people, it's all of our problem, but um, it's something really, I think that white people in our society really need to be working on because people of color have the reality and we don't. We have to be willing to find ways to put ourselves in situations and be advocates and allies and work in connection with people who are really being targeted and oppressed by the system. And how, can you talk to that a little bit? Um, yeah, Don, I see, I think we all have privilege. Like all of us have privilege at one point or another that requires that we have a consciousness about that and ask the question like what is the responsibility that I have mm -hmm. with the privilege that comes to me and so whether we're talking about white privilege or privilege in general I'm not sure that we understand that work and that responsibility but in terms of, of white privilege if you're white white people aren't necessarily conditioned to be conscious of what comes along with that and that it's a privilege in the US and, and often around the world uh, to be white, to have white skin. That because of our history and our legacy of slavery, our legacy of oppression, um, the reality that most major institutions and systems in the US were designed intentionally and legally to serve white people exclusively, what comes along with that is that there is a built-in inherent privilege that's then mm -hmm. offered to the preferred group, mm -hmm. which is people who are white. Mm -hmm. And so white people will be given more credibility, mm -hmm. they will be given more opportunity, they will be given more information, mm -hmm. they will be given all kinds of perks that will just come naturally because mm -hmm. they're white, that people of color will not receive. Mm -hmm. They will receive becoming suspect, they will receive a culture of struggle, Mm -hmm. and they will be forced to have to agitate to get what they need. Mm -hmm. uh, they will receive this um, lack of information mm -hmm. and, and so many other barriers and blockages to them receiving what they need in terms of equity and justice. Well, how do we begin then? Because, um, you know, people could feel, you know, we're working on issues of racism and our own internal racism that we've kind of often in, within the society born and bred to think a certain way and as you kind of restructure your thinking and your consciousness and you know you've exposed yourself to other realities and um, you know you fight on behalf of the the struggle for all people's liberation and you can do that personally but then there's something institutionalized about it as well so how do you do that for your own psyche and psychological makeup and institutionally at the same time. Do you have a, a some kind of formula where people are trying to approach those? Yeah, I don't know if it's a formula, but I have a lot of thoughts about it. I think that personally we have to be willing to recognize that we've learned a lot of stuff wrong about each other. Mm -hmm. We have to be willing to unlearn the, those old socializations uh, that have taught us that certain groups are scary, certain groups are incompetent, certain groups are more more competent, that taught us that there is this transparent preference for whiteness and anything that doesn't fit into that should be put in the category as outsider. We have to be willing to unlearn those kinds of socializations. Mm -hmm. We have to be willing to have conversations and have listening revolutions, mm -hmm. to listen to other people's experience in the world mm -hmm. and in society and in our own cities and within our institutions and in within our structures. Uh, we have to take some courage to create opportunities to hear what's hard to hear, mm -hmm. to make visible what seems invisible. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. And we can't be shy about that. We can't be timid about that. Ignorance is not bliss mm -hmm. in this sense. Mm -hmm. It really isn't uh, because it has real consequences to how we view the world, how mm -hmm. we live out our existence in the world, and how we have our humanity embraced. And so organization, organizationally, um, organizations need to be asking some key questions. Mm -hmm. They need to be asking people of color, what is your experience within our institution and organization around race and ethnicity? What is it that you need? What are some of the barriers that you encounter? I think we have to ask really specific questions mm -hmm. and ask and allow people to give us some real credible data mm -hmm. about what the lived experience is within the institution. If we don't collect the data, mm -hmm. then we really have no hope of actually doing the work or even beginning the work. But then what about policies that can enact, you know, be enacted that uh, make the economic disparities just more just because the economic disparities are so great right now with the you know more difficult um, um, in getting hired maybe for a person of color and just mm -hmm. home ownership and now this whole subprime I mean the African American community and the Latino community take took a you know three times greater hit on all of this money loss and so how does that start being instituted on a policy level? Yeah. I think the data will inform our policy. And part of the reason we don't have the policies is because we're afraid to collect the data. I think when we collect the data, we will find out, for instance, that large numbers of white people are being promoted within organizations over people of color, irregardless of whether they're more qualified, irregardless of whether they have more longevity, um, irregardless of whether they're a good fit or not. But unless we collect that data and are mm -hmm. intentional about collecting that data, then we won't be informed mm -hmm. to change our policies to police our own existence within that institution or those organizations. So the first thing that I advocate is we really need to collect the data from the people of color within those organizations. And then we can do massive racial justice training throughout the organization so that we go back and we hear the story, the historical accounts that we've all heard, mm -hmm. that we've heard from the perspective of those who are white in our history books and in our classrooms and in our college campuses, but that we hear it from the perspective of people of color. We mm -hmm. have to be able to sit with all the perspectives that are in the room. Great. And when we come back, we're going to talk about, we don't have enough time to talk about it all, but we're going to talk about Wham and the Lonsbury Show and the horrible offensive comments he made and why there's a boycott on Wham and Bob Lonsbury. Stay tuned. Rochester Indie TV. <laughs> against the war, we also stand behind those who resist it. More and more U.S. service members are actively refusing to participate in the illegal, immoral invasion and occupation of Iraq. No more. We have a different path to take, and it doesn't matter what they do to us. It doesn't matter if they, if they take away our, um, our honorable discharge, if they put us in prison. Call it peace or call it treason, call it love or call it reason, but I ain't marching anymore. Iraq Vets Against the War is a group of veterans that have served since 9-11 uh, in the war on terror. And uh, we stand for three things. Uh, immediate withdrawal of all U.S. occupying forces from Iraq. Uh, reparations for the Iraqi people. And uh, full benefits for all veterans. And the reason I have the flag upside down on my shoulder is because it's a symbol of distress because I am very distressed. My friends are being stop lost and sent back to Iraq without their consent. Uh, the myth of the volunteer army is very distressing to me because it's not a volunteer army. Uh, we've been enslaving soldiers for six years now under the pretext of a national emergency, which is Dawn with Rochester Indie TV, and today we're talking to Myra Brown from the anti-racism movement, and uh, Myra has been just really enlightening us here about a lot of issues about racism, institutionalized racism, um, the economic disparities, but to, right now we're going to turn the segment to Wham and Bob Lonsberry and the comments he said. Do you want to just set up uh, the whole situation for the listeners and what ARM is working on doing as well with many groups? It's a coalition now in the community of many out 
outraged members and groups, but we want to sure. talk about that. Bob Lonsberry has a long history of targeting people of color and other vulnerable oppressed groups, so that's, that's not a secret. And he was fired a few years ago for referring to our previous mayor as mm -hmm. a monkey mm -hmm. and an orangutan. But I think because he was a politician, you know, it's, it's a no-no to say anything risky about a politician or oppressive about a politician. You'll get quick action with that. On June 10th, he chose to include in his circle of targets children. He mm -hmm. targeted children in the Young Mothers Program as well as the Black Scholars, a program of the Urban League. And he targeted them with some racist, sexist, classist, and near pornographic comments in referring to these students. Um, students who, in the Young Mothers Program, had come out later to say that many of those young women were pregnant because they had been raped. Mm. And he used the most offensive and outrageous language in targeting those, those young people, saying things like, keep your legs together, us sweet cheeks, and everything will be okay saying things like, who gets the certificate? Little sister, take your pants off and spread your legs. That's who gets the certificate. Mm -hmm. In another place in his rants, he said, I wouldn't exactly put black and scholar together. Mm -hmm. And so ARM has been outraged, and there has been a growing community outrage about these comments. I think we have to, as a community, um, step up and take a stand for the kind of beloved community that we want. Mm -hmm. And that's a community where everybody is welcomed, everybody is valued, mm -hmm. especially our children. Mm -hmm. And if we allow Bob Lonsberry to get away with targeting children in these demonstrative, mm -hmm. vicious kinds of ways, what hope do we have to creating the kind of harmony and healing and unity in our community mm -hmm. that we, so, we all so desperately want? Absolutely, but how do you respond? I know there's been on the other side of like the supporter of Wham and Bob Lonsberry saying, "Oh, it's freedom of speech," and uh, he just said, "What is what's true?" Which is, you know, it's obviously disgusting. But what, how have you responded to people like that? Yeah, um, we have heard those comments from people, and what I say to folks is that this is not about freedom of speech. This isn't about freedom of speech, and this is also not about him just telling the truth. You you don't wrap truth in power. What this is about is abuse. This is about abuse of power. Bob Lonsbury has every right to say whatever is in his heart to say, but he doesn't have a right to be paid to say it. Mm -hmm. And so we as a beloved community have a right to call for what we need, the kind of culture we want created on our communal airways. We don't have to pay for our own abuse. And so we're calling for his removal. We called for Wham to remove him from the Bob Lonsbury show. Um, they have chosen to not do the just thing and not do what's right. And so ARM has um, put forth a community call for boycotting the sponsors of WHAM and the Bob Lonsbury Show. Mm -hmm. And so we have specific, um, we've collected data for all of his sponsors of his show mm -hmm. and the sponsors of WHAM. And we're asking people to help to join us in that boycott. Mm -hmm. And so we have numbers, <coughs> we have uh, addresses, places people can send letters to. There's an email address, firebobblonsberry at rockus.org oh, that they can email us at. Um, and we have an action planned July 26 that folks can join us in. They just need to email or call me at Spiritus Christi at 325-1180. Mm -hmm. um, people will be surprised to know what some of those sponsors are that mm -hmm. are backing in and aligning Do you think the sponsors know? what they're supporting? The sponsors that we have chosen um, that we will uh, focus our efforts on first, absolutely they do mm -hmm. know. Um, and those sponsors would be GEICO, ESL Federal Credit Union, hmm. Pace Windows, um, Assemblyman Joe Morelli who has hmm. decided to be a regular guest on the Bob Lansbury show, they're endorsing him. How did Wham respond when you met with them? Arm met with um, Wham. Yeah. Sadly, Wham was in very steep denial. Uh, we actually met with Wham and their Clear Channel uh, locals management team, and what they said to us was that they denied that any of those comments that I just mentioned to you were racist, sexist, or classist in nature, mm -hmm. and they denied. That, that any of those statements even perpetuated racialized stereotypes. Mm -hmm. And so because of that, they said what they think that those statements were were just strong opinions that made us uncomfortable. 
-hmm. And so we had to make it very clear that we're not uncomfortable, we're outraged. Mm -hmm. And denial seems to be a really key component to maintaining the racist uh, institutions that exist. So that's yeah. part of it. Oh, it wasn't as big. That's right. So what about people who then now uh, want to do something both, um, you know, we have this boycott and go to rochesterindemedia.org and people can find out more about it and the, the boycotts and getting involved with ARM. But what about um, work at maybe our workplaces or um, policy we want to work on, the anti-racism workshops. Can you talk about that, how we can? Absolutely. Um, the things that we can do is we can go to our, our places that we work and we can schedule a meeting with our human resources department. We can ask them what are our policies to make sure that we hear from and we, we hear from the experience of people of color within the organization. How are we tracking that? Uh, what groups are making decisions around the policies that we're putting forth? What are the power dynamics at the board table? What groups are missing from that? When we decide to hire, um, are we thinking about what ethnic groups are represented there? Or are we just kind of going with the management without realizing that the management is all white or the management is all male? Mm -hmm. Um, and so we have to ask some specific questions to say we want a, a model of full inclusion for our community, where we work, where we play, and where we recreate. Myra Brown, we don't have enough time. We had so many questions and so many topics. This is great. Thank you so much for coming and talking to us oh, today. And we're going to hear more from Myra Brown and ARM and the anti-racism movement. And stay tuned, Rochester Indie TV. Check us out online, rochesterindymedia.org. You can post an article. You can get involved. You can boycott Wham, the Bob Lonsberry, and the sponsors until Bob Lonsberry is off the air. And to the young mothers and to the black honor students, you guys rock. Keep it up, the good work, and you're watching Rochester Indie TV.